question for you when it comes down to two names. We got Powell, which is obviously the Fed. Chairman of the Fed. Uh, uh, and then we have Yellen, okay, which she sometimes forgets, and she thinks she still has Powell's job, right? She still thinks that's her job, right? Which of those two is creating the biggest havoc, and which of those two has the most influence on what direction rates could go to and what direction real estate could go to the next 12, 24, 36 months. Okay, so we should also mention Janet Yellen used to be the Fed chair. I didn't yes, think she was a very of good course. I didn't think she was yes. a good Fed chair, but she used to be the Fed chair. And what Janet Yellen's job now as Treasury Secretary, besides signing the money that comes out, we, you know, the Treasury Secretary signs, signs the cash that you get, is Janet Yellen sells the president's agenda. So What's her job to do is not what's good for you, what's good for me, what's good for people listening. It is to sell the president's agenda. Let's understand that, right? So she's a salesperson right now. She had different responsibilities as a Fed chair. But it is crazy and maddening to hear this woman talk about the wealth gap that's out there and wealth inequality when her and Ben Bernanke created it. Because what they decided to do was now, who knows what the motivation was? It might have been pure motivation. But what they decided to do was they took rates to these unbelievably low levels, begin quantitative easing, and by taking rates to where you were punished for savings, they gave us, as we all know, TINA, T-I-N-A, which stands for there is no alternative. And Bernanke used to call this the wealth effect. And what he said was if we stop people from saving and force them to all put their money collectively, it's the same thing that the Reddit boards are doing, okay? It's just on a grander scale. It's no different than the Reddit meme stocks except they did it Wall with the Street over. Bets. Wall Street bets. Yeah. It's the exact same thing, except now they've got the whole country doing it because I'm going to punish you for saving. I'm going to let you earn less than 1% in your savings. And the only place you could put your money is in the stock market. And by doing so, everybody did that. The stock market has been on what kind of a ride since then. Mm-hmm. We all know, okay? So when you see that occur... By, by the way, I, folks, I want you to hear... Can you say that one more time? Say the last 30 seconds one more time what they've done. This is very important. They punished you to save your money, to put into market. market. Say that one more time. So by taking the, the benefit of saving money, people used to say, I could plan for my retirement because I could put my money in the bank yeah. safely, get 4%, 5%, 6%. Money market, CD, saving account. You have many options. It's safe. I can plan for my retirement. Now, I can never retire like that. Okay, I can't do that. And what would happen to those people is that they were forced – people that shouldn't be taking risks. Grandma was now taking risks and putting them in the stock market. Fortunately, because everybody did it, it created growth in the stock market as we have seen for the Mm -hmm. last 12 years, right? However, here's the big point, is that not everybody's in the stock market. So this is what created the haves and the have-nots to a much more exacerbated Mm -hmm. way because now people, 50% of families were able to go in the stock market, 50% of families benefited. Those 50% that were left behind were left way behind. And it is sickening to hear her talk about it as if she had nothing to do with it because her and Ben Bernanke created this. Mm -hmm. It's the Wall Street versus Main Street approach right there. Wall Street versus Main Street approach. Exactly right. So, so you're not a fan of Yellen or what she's I, done. I think the she, policies I, I, she's implemented. I don't, I don't think that she, you know, well, currently, again, she's a salesperson. So, you know, you always have to be a little leery of salespeople because they all have their agenda, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what well, would you say to somebody who says, well, Barry's a salesperson. He's got an agenda. He's in real estate. Uh, well, every individual has their own agenda, right? Mm-hmm. Where, you, where, you, where you stand depends on where you sit, right? So you, you, have, you have your point of view, and everybody's trying to do that. Uh, I'm, I'm offering an opinion, which is just that. It's an opinion. That's the way it should be taken, right? It's not uh, – there's some things that are factual. There's some of the data we spoke about is factual. Mm-hmm. But in this case, it's an opinion. Uh, I don't think she did a very good job as as the Fed chair as well. Um, I think that she had chances where she could have raised rates and did not do so. I think that I think that the Fed gets frightened because who wants to be named as the Fed chair who let the economy tank? And that's the problem Jay Powell, who you mentioned, has right mm-hmm. now. Because what he tried in 2013 to taper, the market went into a tantrum and he backed off. Now that was taking the Fed's balance sheet from 4.3 trillion. <laughs> to 3.8 trillion, and they say, can't do it. Now the Fed's balance sheet is $8 trillion. That's a, that's a scary thought when you think about that. So I mean, let's, let, let's do this. $8 trillion dollar let, balance sheet. Let's do this. This is fun because everybody is listening. They're hearing trillion, trillion, trillion. So listen, if I said to you, hey, let's do a business deal, cash deal. And I said, Patrick, I'm going to pay you cash, $100,000 cash. I bring a brief, big suitcase in. I open up the suitcase, and it's $100 bills. It's very anticlimactic. It's a four-inch stack of $100 bills, much, right? Yeah. A million dollars is 
a 40 inch stack of hundred dollar bills. If you could stack hundred dollar bills this high, it's a million bucks. A billion takes you to the Empire State Building twice. Eight trillion, if I stack them up one on top of each other and then tilted it on its side, it'd go from here to California and back 5,400 miles. That's what $8 trillion is in $100 bills. It is an enormous sum of money, and we get blind to it because we constantly hear it and we become immune. Yeah. So, so then, the question becomes, then the question becomes when you, we're talking about interest rates, how likely and how soon do you predict the rates could go up to 6%? Can it happen? If yes, how soon can that happen? Okay, so so let's understand um, there's a few things occurring right now. So I'm going to answer that question, but let's give some background. So I do think there might be some policy change coming in August. So it's it, we think, I think that when we get the Jackson Hole meeting by the Fed, that has in the past been where they change policy. Now, we heard from the St. Louis Fed President Bullard. We also just heard from um, another Fed president who was talk. oh, uh, we, were talk- we were talking about the fact that the housing market might be overheating. And when we, he- oh, this, this was the Boston Fed president. Um, I'll get it in a minute. The Boston Fed president talked about the housing market overheating. So what they're saying is that the Fed should stop buying mortgage-backed securities. Eric Rosengren Eric is who it was, yes. So the two of them now have been talking about the, the market overheating. So I think come the 26th, 27, 28th of August at that meeting, they may say that the Fed's going to begin to taper their purchases of mortgage-backed securities. How much are they buying? Well, they lie. They said they were buying $40 billion. We started calling them out on it. So what did they do? They removed the data from the NewYorkFed.org, so you couldn't find it that easily. Um, r- recently, they purchased about $80 billion in a month. So now they changed their language to $40 billion to a hundred uh, to at least $40 billion a month. But it's closer to $100 billion a month that they're buying. So they're buying the market. It's called yield curve control. We haven't really done it since the 1940s, but they've pegged yields, and they said we want to keep it here. Think about how crazy it is. Inflation erodes the buying power. The inflation rate right now, let's call it 3.5% is the core rate stripping out food and energy. The 10-year Treasury yield is 1.5%. So I'm getting 1.5%, but my money's eroding at 3.5%. That should never happen. You how, should... sustain... how long can that be sustainable? <laughs> it shouldn't be sustainable, but when the Fed is buying so much in Treasuries to keep and suppress that yield down artificially... If inflation's three and a half, you got to make a spread on that. It's got to be four and a half. That's where the ten-year Treasury should be with three and a half percent inflation. Now I think inflation will abate. I think inflation will come. To, I know the Fed loves the transitory. There are certain things that will stick. But look, Patrick, if you take a look at some of the reasons why the the numbers in CPI went up and the numbers in the PC personal consumption expenditures, a different inflation report that the Fed loves. The reason why they went up is the reopening, because what really went up is. Uh, sporting event sales went up 10%. Hotels went up 9%. Airlines went up 10%. And then you have the chip shortage issue. So it made uh, vehicles go up 5% and compute. I'm sorry, 10% of ve- and computers go up 5%. Because of that, it made a big jump in CPI. But those sectors combined only represent 7% of the economy. The other 93% only went up three tenths of a percent. So we have some inflation. It's not as high as being stated. It will calm down. But rates will never go to 6%. Never go to 6%. No, at least not while I'm around, I don't think, because what has to cause that is you need enormous inflation. Technology is advancing so much, it is keeping costs lower. Artificial intelligence, robotics, technology in general will continue to make things cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And in addition to that, the supply of labor that we have is pretty strong. We're in a position that if jobs become eliminated, you're going to see costs continue to be pressured lower. And also global globalization has kept so, so Arthur Laffer, whom uh, Love uh, him. you know who he is. Love I him. spoke to him, uh, was it last week, Kai? Last week we had him on or something? Two weeks ago I said, that, what's your biggest concern? Where do you stand with uh, inflation? He says, I'm not at all worried about inflation because he said the leading indicator of inflation to me is gold prices and gold prices and gold prices haven't moved. Then I asked Danielle and Danielle's like, no, inflation is here. There's nothing we can do about it. It's going to continue to go up. Where do you stand with inflation? Love art. Danielle's right. Inflation will be some some inflation is going to be sticky. Okay, some especially on the wages. That's the stickiest. Part Are we going to go into hyperinflation mode or no? No, no, no. Okay. We're not we're not going to do that. Although there's a lot of money sloshing around, but no hyperinflation, and and you can't just go buy gold anymore because you know the boomer rocks of gold used to be a good indicator. And since the beginning of time, they say one ounce of gold should buy one fine man's suit, right? And that probably is still true today. So with gold at a little over seventeen hundred dollars an ounce, I think that 
you know, that still holds true. But gold isn't the only indicator because of the rise of cryptocurrencies. So if you don't believe in fiat money because of the printing press, you had the alternative of gold before, but now you also have the alternative of crypto. So gold, if it were not for crypto, gold would be at a much higher level. All right, so you're not too worried about inflation. You don't think rates are going to get to well, 6% anytime soon. concerned about inflation, but I do think it will abate, and I think some of it was going to be sticky and stay. All right. But here's the thing that we have to understand, is that debt, and I know most people don't get this, and this I'm going to give a hat tip to one of my mentors, Lacey Hunt, was one, one of the most brilliant minds out there. So he taught me this and showed me this, but debt, we know this every time in history and everywhere in the world, the higher the debt, the lower the rates. Because what debt does is it drives economic activity slower, which prevents inflation. If you have a family that wants to buy a car, when we were kids, used to have a piggy bank, used to have a piggy bank. You'd save up, you break the piggy bank, you go buy it, great. Mm -hmm. As adults, who wants to do that? We want instant gratification, we want it now. Yep. So we use credit to take a future purchase and make it today. If a family wants to buy a car, they go out and they buy that car today using credit, using debt, and it creates economic activity. Economic activity, what that will do is the dealership, the manufacturer, the salesperson, they all make money, they spend money, but it has a short life. What sticks is now that family has a $1,000 a month debt for the next 60 months, which means they could buy less. And it's the same thing with our economy. CARES Act 1 and 2 was $2.8 trillion. That was in March and April of 2020. By October, the economy was already slowing. The, the GDP for the United States was 4.3% in 2020. In the fourth quarter, it was 0.4%. It was all front-loaded, and I. the reason why there's such panic to generate these additional stimulus plans right now is because they know that the, the sugar rush will begin to slow. Okay. All right, so we'll see what happen. I mean, obviously, it's great to hear different perspectives, but, you know, the audience has to make up their minds. Uh, the one part that was very... Uh, eye-opening was to say in 07, 08, when the whole Michael Burry big short happened, there was 3.7 million inventory. Today's a million. That's a very big difference in indicator because mm -hmm. you got almost way too much. And then 12 million increase in uh, uh, family uh, households. You're talking about 12 million from what? From 160 million to 128 Bingo. million was a number, give or take. So, And Patrick, remember, birth rates stayed low from 1973 to 1979 which means you did not have the influx of yeah. people coming. Yeah, and and now things have turned a little bit. because it's the exact the, opposite. What's the generation they're saying that's bigger than boomers? Is it Gen X or is it millennials? No, millennials. Millennials are yeah. bigger than boomers now, mm -hmm. 80 million versus 76 million. So if that's the case, you're saying real estate's gonna continue to rise over the next few years. Let's hope it doesn't get too far ahead of itself, but let's say it this way, it should be well supported. So if you enjoyed this little short segment from the podcast that we did, here's another short segment to watch. Or if you want to see the entire podcast, click over here. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.